Welcome to New England Authors. It's a pleasure to have you. And we're trying to talk about New England here, as, as the show implies. And today we're going to talk about the Charles River. Our guest is Kathleen Rowe. Very good to, uh, for you to come and be on our show. And Thank you have you. a book called Exploring the Charles River. Yes. Um, you got interested in the Charles River how? To, why don't well, you read, why don't you read okay. us uh, how you got interested in it? All right. Um, many years ago, while I was a senior at a small Kansas college, I came to Boston to interview for teaching positions. And during that week, I met a high school friend in Park Square for a tour around the Boston Common and a stop at Bailey's for ice cream topped with my first Jimmy's or sprinkles. Then we took the red line from Park to Harvard Square and as the subway headed up out of the dark tunnel, I was amazed to see the jewel that was the Charles River Basin sparkling in the sunlight for one brief moment as the train rode over the Longfellow Bridge. I will never forget that April day and my first view of the Charles with the sailboats on the water. Two days after that visit, or two years, excuse me, I moved to Boston and continued my interest taking bicycle trips from Watertown to Boston. Yeah. And I also um, had a demonstration of how to rig a sailboat at Community Boating, which um, was taped for my course at BU. I did that too. You I, too? Yeah, I took, uh, I, and I wrote, I of course ride a, a, along the, the river as well. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sorry. A lot of people though do yeah. that. Um, and I still have a painting I've made of the river up somewhere in the attic. Um, later, as a teacher in an elementary school, which happened to be across the street from the, the old Waltham Watch Factory building, I would escort student groups along the river walk to the public library. My son and I paddled a double kayak one Mother's Day at the Newton Charles uh, River Kayak and Canoe Center, and my husband and I watched the regatta, or have watched it more than once, from the shores in Cambridge, and the run of the river in Waltham, biking along the Charles River Reservation from Watertown to Newton. So it was no surprise when I decided one summer to learn about the ri river firsthand from beginning to end after looking at Max Hall's book, The People's River, which was published around 1984. On a beautiful July day, I started in Hopkinton with a camera and a notebook, and I have been exploring ever since. Um, and another thing that helped was there was another author, Michael Tugius. He had written a book about canoeing on the Charles and as a fisherman's point of view. And so I had some of his thoughts on different spots along the way. So there are other people that were had written before. So my point of view was to start not at the necessarily at the very beginning of the river where the um, where the you know the river itself starts or begins. That, that's Hopkinton. Yes, that, yes. yes yeah. um, yeah. Although I did have to bring it up pretty soon in the book, but my main thing was I decided I would take the route of going up river because the history of the river starts in the Boston area in the harbor mm -hmm. and you work up because you have the events around Paul Revere's ride and the British engagement in the uh, city of Boston. So that's kind of where the whole thing, a lot of the history started. Yeah. So I worked my way up um, besides looking around at these other towns way out, like Medway and, and um, Medfield and uh, some of the other towns, um, I do have to tell a funny story. My first time of kind of exploring on foot the river was in Hopkinton, and, um, or Milford, I should say. There, was, there used to be some kind of a controversy about whether it started in Hopkinton or, Mil or Milford. It doesn't really matter, but there is a water... Um, there's a place in Milford that um, they treat the water and then they disseminate it to different towns. So anyway, I was in the Milford area, I should say, uh, the town of Milford. This was quite a while back. And I was looking along the river and, and I said, where did it go? <laughs> so yeah. I looked and it had gone underneath the street in a culvert. Mm -hmm. It had gone under the main street of town right in front of the town hall. And then I said, and now where is it going? And then I followed, I walked across the street and I found it on the other side behind someone's backyard and so on. So it's quite a, it's an interesting little river and it has a lot of twists and turns. Now, it's not the biggest river in New England. No. It's only 80 miles long, right? That's right. The Connecticut River is uh, 200 something miles long, uh, right? Yeah. 
But, but it's very important, River. Yes, um, this has so much history to it. I couldn't believe it once I got started and began exploring the history of it all. And not only going along the river, but reading about it. And um, the, the reason, too, that the river has this very um, twisting, turning kind of uh, route that it follows at 80 miles is the fact that they, um, it's a very small river and it is narrow and it, has, it goes over rocks, so it really never gets a chance to build up and, and become a long, uh, straight, uh, with a lot of water power river yeah. that can um, create its own path. Yes, that's right, because the Boston Marathon starts in Hopkinton, and that's 26.2 miles, and this is uh, uh, 80 miles, so it really does a, a lot of twists and turns. And so, so in the book, you start at the, uh, at the end and go upstream. Right. Um, well, in the yeah. book, yes, I, in, yes, the mouth the of the river in the, as it goes yeah. into the harbor. Now, so you told us that um, uh, people, uh, you, you explain a lot of history I here, and you told us uh, the uh, white men started building dams in the 1600s, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Can you talk a little about the, the Indians, the white men, and what the... Um, what the connection between the two uh, was? Well, one of the first encounters was in Watertown. And the, what, what the river had, the river was flowing out into a large, kind of like a basin, not what we see today, and mingling with the seawater that came up mm -hmm. during the tides. So that, it created an estuary that was very rich and there were lots of fish for the Native Americans to um, use in their diet, and so they were out there fishing. And they built weirs that were structures using sticks, kind of slow down the fish, and then they'd go after them with their nets, or they even had little sort of like dams with rocks that they would use to kind of stop the river or make it pool around so they could get it with their, again, with their nets. Was, was this the Massachusetts tribe? Uh, it was the, there were several tribes. It was in the big Algonquin nation, which yeah, went but, all the way uh, down the, the coast. Yeah. So there was the Massachusetts, which means Great River there, mm -hmm. and there also, there were others around in the area with their wee twos, their little huts that they made. Well, the first encounter that is courted, let's put it that way, was when um, a person with his group of men came over to the place where the estuary um, had formed around what is now Watertown. Mm -hmm. And they knew that there were Native Americans in that, or Natives in that section, and they were a little anxious about it. Can we sleep here this evening, they wondered. So they um, actually had, we, they actually met, and one of the Native Americans offered the, um, the people there, the um, visitors, a loaf of bread. And so then, um, in turn, the white people gave the Natives a, um, I'm sorry, they offered them a fish, excuse me, a bass. Yeah. And then the white pe people there gave them um, the loaf, loaf of, of bread. bread. Mm -hmm. And that particular event is memorialized forever on the Watertown town seal. Mm -hmm. And then um, that particular person, however, was asked to go over to Dorchester. He had other things to do. His name was Roger Clapp. And then in his place, a month later, came the well-known Sir Richard Saltonstall. So he worked his way up the river, he and his friends in a boat, and he landed there, and he started the, he was part of the foundation of Watertown and the other towns that were part of it. Because mm. Watertown once, well, actually Cambridge and encompassed mm. a lot of towns. Yeah, so they, and then the, uh, the, the, the English people, uh, there were only about 10, um, uh, white people in that uh, w Watertown event, if I remember right, in, in your book, right? It was small. It was yeah. a small group, and there were a couple of hundred of the Native people. Uh, and it was a very peaceful encounter at the beginning. Um, but you talk about King Philip's War. Can you, oh. can you elaborate on this? Oh, that was awful. It was around 1660s for two years, and it was very um, 
very, very um, violent. Um, what it's, how it started was, well, first I want to say that the way this Native American received this name King Philip, he was named that is sort of sarcastically yes. by, the, by the white people. And uh, he and his brother, they thought, he thought that the white men had killed his brother um, because his brother had suddenly had had a meal with the English mm -hmm. and suddenly he was sick and, they, and he died. And this really enraged King Philip more than he already was. And I want to mention to you that... So the King Philip is this Native American, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I want to mention that he and his brother were the sons of the original Massasoit that mm -hmm. helped the, the um, pilgrims when they came over. Right. So anyway, um, this was at the beginning of hostilities, and it really was boiling down to King Philip wanting to have their land and do what they want with it and have their lives and not have to give to the, um, or bend to the ways of the white Puritans mm. who wanted to cut their hair short but there was one good experience that took place in Natick along the river. Um, and it was, there was an Indian praying village and Father uh, Reverend John Elliott um, was the minister who worked with these people. And he, um, they had their own little village and they got up, went after their own fish and they had a grist mill. And he actually, this Elliot, he put their words into the Bible. He took yeah. the Algonquin language, which had was not written at right. that point, yeah. and managed to write the entire Bible with it. Right. And then it's kind of interesting that there's this little library called the Bacon Library in South Natick that has one of the two copies of that famous document in a little safe down in there, small. Oh. Yes, Museum. I think we, ha we have it here in the Harvard uh, Museum <laughs> of, um, uh, uh, of Anthropology uh, uh, right over here. Well, that's I've great. seen it. Now I've I get to, it. Yeah. I, I can look at it here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can look at it over here. So uh, anyway, the, the, uh, white, we know the story. White men took over. They, they, um, they killed a lot of people. How many dams did they make altogether? How many dams are there? Oh, on the Charles River? Yeah. Well, in the course of the dam building era, starting actually the first dam was Thomas Mayhew in what is now Watertown, and he built the dam to create enough falling water to run a mill, a grist mill. Yeah. And um, so that was the first. And then after that, that seemed to be the main reason for having the dams along the river is to provide energy, to turn the wheels of whatever commerce. Yeah. So anyway, there were at one point 20 dams. Wow. And right now I can't tell you how many there are because um, conservationists, um, people from Charles River Watershed Association, are slowly closing down the dams wherever they can yeah. because they're not serving any good purpose anymore. Mm. Uh -huh. The fish have to jump up. That's yeah. another thing. You know about the fish migrating yes, yes. to the fresh water in order to spawn every spring? And they have to jump up, and then there's also little fish ladders that have been created along the side. And what happens behind a dam is the water gets very kind of stale and not mm. enough oxygen, so it's bad for the river's health. So right. they're working on that. Watertown is going to be one of the dams to come down in the near future. They already, I think, Bellingham may have already done it. Uh, th this is New England authors. Uh, we're, we're speaking with uh, Kathleen Rowe. Her book is Exploring the Charles River. Uh, I have a particular interest in the Charles River because um, I, I am a docent at the Museum of Science, mm -hmm. and we have uh, a whole Charles River gallery. I work in that sometimes, and what we do is uh, I go out the, the, the Museum of Science sits right on the Charles River, on the last dam of the Charles River. We go out and we fish out some water and, and uh, put it under a microscope and show it to people. And in the summertime, it is just full of so much life. There's, there are all kinds of, of uh, things moving around and jumping around, and we look at them. Uh, in the wintertime, it's, it's less so. So um, what's the health of the river like, you know? Well, yeah. it's improved a lot. Um, it started in the mid-60s when it became evident that the river was in very bad shape. And that was the beginning of, through the 
um, there was a group of women in a little uh, gathering in Newton, and they started this organization, which became the Charles River Watershed Association. And that organization, for years now, since the mid-60s, has been upgrading the river through various ways of approaching, mm -hmm. either trying to take care of the runoff problems, closing off pipes that were emitting things into the water. And one of the things, um, too, is that they have fundraisers to have other kinds of activities and to increase awareness of the river. And they, are, they were so good at what they were doing that in 2011, there was a prize. That's, um, it was an international prize that was given to the CRWA for their wonderful work. And so, and Robert Zimmerman was the um, head of the organization at the time. So they received that for their so, work. Yeah, I think, uh, I think all over New England, the rivers are so much cleaner now than, than there are. There, there's more forested land. And so um, I wanted to ask you about climate change. How is that impacting the health of the Charles and other rivers? Do you know? Well, uh, that was one of my questions at the Broadmoor Sanctuary, which is in on the Natick Sharon line upriver. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to Alyssa Landry there about, you know, what, what are their concerns and what they're noticing is certain kinds of birds and other animals. Um, they're not seeing as many of certain kinds. I can't get specific about it, but they are studying the effects and this is something of great concern. Is the river itself getting warmer, do you know? You know, I don't know that. Over the years, there have been a number of people who have volunteered their time to go and check the condition of the river, uh, take samples and everything. But I cannot tell you if it has become warmer. But I will say that it has gone up a couple of grade levels to a play point where it's almost, it is sometimes swimmable. And the Charles River Conservancy, um, it also had an import, has an important role in the health of the river in that it works with the parklands to make, because those are what feed into the water itself. So Renata von Scharner, the head of, the, um, of that organization for 18 years, was instrumental in starting a series of swim days in July when they see that there hasn't been any runoff from storms and the, the water is a certain level, they test it, and people have been going to those swim events and jumping in and swimming. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us about some of the sites along the Charles that we don't want to miss. Oh, okay? there's so many. There's so uh, many, yes, because of course it goes through the, many of the important cities in, in uh, New England. Oh yeah, 23 so, towns and cities. 23 towns. And not mm -hmm. to mention that it's in the watershed itself, that where all the water feeds into the river. That is 35 different communities in there. Mm -hmm. as far out as Norfolk and places of, in that area. Yeah. So, well, some of the sites, um, first of all, I'll mention one of the things that stands out for me um, when I think of that is that there is a wonderful arched bridge, um, very large in Newton. And it is the, um, actually, it is this place where the Sudbury Aqueduct runs across the top of it. Mm -hmm. They call it Echo Bridge because you can stand on a platform at the bottom and hear your echo. And you can walk across the top of it. And there used to be a mills there that mm -hmm. were run with the running water. Mm -hmm. And that's a very special place to visit. Um, and then let's see, there's, a, there's really a lot. I mean, the Broadmoor Sanctuary that we just mentioned yes. is a great place to visit. So, uh, and also the, the Horticulture Society used to have their headquarters. This is a beautiful building uh, inside uh, of their library here. And they moved to where? They moved right well, along the river, right? Yes, they are, they consider themselves mostly in Dover, but when you're going along Route 16, you come to the entrance and a bridge that you cross over, and that is in Wellesley. Mm. So, but it's mostly Dover, and it's a number of acres, beautiful flowers and a, an old Italianate estate right there and it's and they have a wonderful library there yeah so yeah, that's a great place yeah so um, I wanted to ask you about uh, one thing that you 
brought up in, in your book was uh, Brook Farm of the Transcendentalist Movement. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, could you tell us a little about that? It, it was right on the river, right? Yes, and, and you know, it's right in the um, Rocks, West Roxbury, Roxbury area. Yeah. West Roxbury, so, so I don't know. Not too far from our studio, really. Oh, all right. Yeah. And you know, I don't see, when I went there, I was kind of disappointed there wasn't a lot there, but then that was four years ago, and maybe I need to go back, but they had a couple of the structures that were still there, mm -hmm. and these people trying to start a new life. in the a, a utopian existence. Yes, yeah. were there. And uh, it's, who, who were these people then? I think Emerson was one. Uh, I, I don't think Mr. Alcott was there, but... Um, yes, he oh, was, was there. He? Yeah, Mr. Alcott was there, and things got so bad, he and his, and his family, he, uh, that his wife said, I'm taking the kids. If you want to come, you're welcome to. <laughs> things degenerated there. It was supposed to be this, uh, this utopian community. Hawthorne was involved yes. uh, and other people. Maybe I'm not sure about um, Thoreau. He was kind of an outsider. But anyway, that was an interesting uh, place along the river. What yeah. a discovery there, I mean, of all places. And there's so many little places that you wouldn't know unless you'd read about it or how, other ways of being informed. So now, nowadays, there's no real tra uh, travel that goes uh, up and down the Charles. Is that right? No, uh, strictly recreational at this but point. But at one point, it was it was the river of travel. Yes, it was, and even before they built the kind of bridges we have, there were tall masted ships, and there was a real concern during the War of 1812, that two year war, whatever, that the British would come up river and take from the um, Americans, some of their arsenals and whatever, but um, but anyhow, before that happened, you know the Charlestown Navy Yard down at yes. the well. Yeah. So what happened That's was where the U.S. SS Constitution is. Yes. Right. Well, what it is is that then at that point in history, people, Americans decided let's put our um, ammunition stores up in Watertown, mm. and that is part of what how the Watertown Arsenal began although it really was an arsenal to a large extent for World War II munitions and everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up um, some of the, uh, of the history of the Charles River. Um, what else can we expect to see? Uh, but this is a great guide. If you want to explore the river, get this book and look at all, uh, look at all there is to see and, um, and it has places where you could rent the kayak and so on. So it's a, it's a very good uh, guide to it. Uh, what else uh, do we expect out of the Charles River? Well, <laughs> there are lots of events that happen on the river. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, one of the ones that I learned um, not too long ago was that there is a May Day celebration in early May at 5 a.m. in the morning right across from Harvard. Oh, I never uh, even knew that. I know. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're, and they come, some of them come out in costume, some of the people. There's a May pole. And then there is this celebration of the autumnal equinox uh -huh. on the side of the river in that same general area near the footbridge across from Harvard. And people are in costume, and the revels might come and sing and dance, and it was, yeah. it's quite festive. Yeah. And then don't forget the the amazing um, regatta race every year at the in the third full weekend of October. That's another wonderful thing to go to. I uh, know thousands of people go yes, to that. Yes, yes. Yeah. But there are ways of getting there, uh, getting your bicycle or walking or whatever and finding a good place to look at everything that's going on. And there's a dragon uh, dragon race? Yes, yes every dragon. beginning of every June. It, it's, of course, a cultural um, event from the Chinese. And it's, uh, the dragon boats are quite interesting. And it's various people, all kinds of people can be in these races. And there is a, a park called the Paul Revere Park. It's in Charlestown, and it's um, a very small five acre, near, very nice park, but um, it looks out over, sort of. I mean, you have to kind of walk away from a bit to see over to the North End because that was where some members of the Sons of Liberty were watching for the signal from the, from mm -hmm. the church tower. Mm -hmm. So, and so then the um, British came across on their boats, and Paul Revere ahead of them went by and on, on a small rowboat. And, when they got to the Charlestown side, then he proceeded to start riding. The horse was ready for him, and he started off on his ride. 
And Longfellow had a lot to do with the river because he even wrote a poem about crossing it because he had a girlfriend over in Beacon Hill in later years and he would walk across from his home in Cambridge over to Boston to see her. And so now there is part of one of his poems that is engraved um, down at the bottom of this new bridge that we now have, the new footbridge that goes over the uh, Storo Drive area. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, near the, right next to the Longfellow Bridge. Yes. Uh, yeah, right next to the Longfellow Which Bridge. Which has been yeah. beautifully refurbished, as you know. Yes, it's a beautifully refurbished bridge. So, but the, that area was very different in Longfellow's time. It was all marsh, right? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, they filled in. How did mm -hmm. they fill in all that marsh? Well, most of the back bay, I can't say about that marsh, but most of the back bay was filled in by train loads of, of gravel and dirt that came all the way from Needham. It's amazing. I know. It, it's amazing. <laughs> it, it, they had to do it by shovel, right? They didn't have, uh, they didn't have bulldozers. Or no, they, but they, they had trains at least. They then. had They trains. did have trains. Back and forth, every day, yeah. every night, these trains would go and fill in the various parts of Back Bay. Um, enough so they could have buildings there. And a friend of mine once said to me jokingly as we stood in Copley Square, this is, this is Needham right here where I come from. And she said because of all the dirt and, and soil from Needham. But anyway, so that was quite an undertaking. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, the, the book that we're looking at is Exploring the Charles River. This is Kathleen Rowe, who, who wrote the book. And it's a, it's a wonderful book to take with you, with you and, and uh, look around in the Charles River area. This is uh, New England Authors. We, uh, we record here in Cambridge, Massachusetts and broadcast on stations throughout the area. Remember, watch locally. Thank you.